Hello, I'm Deborah Sims. I'm a CLL patient from Melbourne in Australia, and I'm on a uh, trial of venetoclax and obinutuzumab and I'm with probably the most famous CLL patient in the world, uh, Dr. Brian Kaufman from the uh, CLL Society who has just almost become record-breaking because he's just had the cutting-edge treatment that uh, we're all hearing a lot about. Um, Brian, it's so wonderful to see you. You've just done CAR-T. How, how long ago now? So I had the CAR T cells myself on uh, March 22nd. So now it's mid-June, so it's two and a half months ago that I had the CAR Ts. And here I am in Stockholm and uh, able to participate in a meeting, learn about the CAR T cells, learn about new therapies in CLL. And um, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to tell that uh, I am now MRD negative, that minimal residual disease negative. So when they look with very sophisticated techniques and my bone marrow going down to one in 100,000 cells, they can't find any signature of the CLL cells there anymore. When they look in my peripheral blood, they can't find it. All, I had innumerably enlarged lymph nodes. All of those are completely gone at this point. So as best as science can measure, I have no detectable CLL anymore. Now I'm not gonna say I'm cured, because it's too soon to say that, but I'm thrilled. I mean, I flew up to Seattle, uh, had the, uh, this done at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance Hutch Institute, and was one of maybe the first 100 patients in the world to have CAR-T for CLL, but I've had a fabulous result. And it is, it's incredible, because I saw you at IWCLL in New York uh, last year, so last March, April, and you weren't, you weren't well. You were relapsing quite quickly on ibrutinib. Um, what made you take, uh, CAR-T is obviously very dangerous, we've both lost a, a close friend, sadly, uh, it, it, the, same, the same week as you were right. having CAR-T and Lisa Minkov, and our thoughts always with her family. How, how did you bring yourself to make that decision that once you were relapsing to go straight to CAR-T? So, one of the things I, I say to um, my fellow patients with CLL is that you ha when you have this disease, you have to make life-changing decisions with incomplete knowledge and conflicting advice. And boy, did that ever come home to me because I really got conflicting advice from doctors who I really respect in terms of what would the best move would be. Uh, my CLL, I'm very, very grateful for the ibrutinib. I mean, I got six and a half years with very aggressive disease, 17 b deleted, 11Q, notch one, unmutated, ZAP70 positive. So I got six and a half years of a high quality life out of ibrutinib, but it was clearly I was relapse, relapsing. My disease was mutagenic, it was changing. I was developing new clones. And the trial was open uh, and it was about to close. I was the 36 patient, they took 40 patients in total. And the trial is now closed. So I thought this was my opportunity to grab this and maybe this was, you know, using an American analogy, a baseball analogy, kind of swinging for a home run. And this, was, this gave me exactly what I came for, this deep, deep remission. The other thing I thought is if it didn't work, you know, I would still have other options. There would still be drugs that I could try, but this trial wouldn't be available to me. And the CAR T therapy can be complicated to get. You have to find the exact right trial in the right situation. So it just seemed like the right decision at the right time for me. The one thing I do want to point out is that I was tremendously um, successful in that, but it was not easy. I mean, I had two hospital admissions. The first was something called cytokine release syndrome or CRS. I was extraordinarily sick during that time. Flu-like illnesses, high fever, achy pains. But I got over that. I got home, got better. And then four or five days later, I was back in hospital, much, much worse. I mean, much worse. I had to be lifted by attendants, by two gurneys, take an, an ambulance to get into the hospital, high fevers, sky high levels of the inflammatory markers in my blood. My legs swell up. I had what's called pitting edema, where you could leave a thumbprint in my thigh, where you could see it. My legs were red and swollen. I couldn't move. I was in excruciating pain and opioids but they gave me the medications to reverse that and I got better. I had to actually learn how to walk again because I lost the ability to walk for several days. But you know, I'm recovering and I'm getting better, but this isn't for everyone and not everyone. And as you mentioned, 
Lisa was down the hall from me. It's hard to talk about this, but she passed while I was in the hospital, and we don't know why. It's mm -hmm. not like they can look at you and say, you're going to do really well, and you, you know, we're not so sure about you. They don't know yet. They can't predict who's going to do well and who isn't going to do mm -hmm. well. So this is really, uh, you know, a significant choice for people to take. It's certainly not a frontline therapy, and it's certainly one you have to go into with your eyes open. And that's, that's the point, isn't it? We're both MRD negative, which is, you know, I've now been MRD negative on my treatment for 29 months, and, and, that, and I m remain on therapy. But at what cost? Mm. And, and for you, that's, I mean, you were taken to a very dark place. Right. I'm, I, was, I was on such high doses of medications, I was gone. I mean, I, I was hallucinating. I wasn't there. And the other piece I would say is this is much harder for the caregivers who were there because I was out of it. I mean, I didn't know, you know, my wife reported back to me, did you know you did this? You didn't know you did that? And my, my adult children were there with me and they reported things that I don't have any recollection of because I was so far gone. So that's the other thing. If you're gonna do a therapy like this, you need to have a, a support network around you. You need to have family or very close friends who are willing to stay with you, sleep in a cot next to you in the hospital bed, be paired to, to see you quite ill. Now, not everybody goes through this. Other people, the CAR-T is like a non-event. They go, they're a little achy, a little fever, and they get a complete remission. But again, they can't predict who's going to have an easy time and who's going to have a difficult time. But you know, like you and I both have difficult aggressive diseases. Some people, bless them, their CLL is much milder, and they don't have to go through this. But you and I had failed other therapies, failed some of the very best therapies, mm -hmm and we're left with an disease was an aggressive, so you have to sometimes take the risks and say, okay, I'm gonna do something. And you jumped into a very early, early, like you're one of the patients, the longest patients on the drug that you're on, venetoclax. I was one of the very first patients in the world on ibrutinib, and one of the very first patients with CAR-T for um, CLL. Well, let's hope this is no more treatment for right. you, Brian. That no more treatment for you. <laughs> it would be um, yeah, amazing. You're looking so well. Yeah. Um, it's Thank amazing you. that you've got to Sweden. What you know? What is exciting for you in the science here? What are you, what sessions have you been sort of going to that that have uh, really stimulated you and made you give you know have hope for other patients? Because CAR T, as you say, isn't for everyone. So we are looking at the combinations. We are looking at what the scientists are doing. So I, I think that there's two questions that are needed to be answered in the European Hematologic Association meeting, EHA meeting here in Sweden is looking at these two in um, some detail. And the first is how do we measure success? Because it's great that you and I are doing so well, but waiting for overall survival, God willing, we're gonna be waiting 20, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. You can't really run a trial for 20, 30, 40 mm -hmm. years. So are there surrogate markers, and that surrogate marker is MRD negative, minimal residual disease negative. Is that really gonna stand up? In chemoimmunotherapy, we know it stands up, but we don't know yet whether it stands up in novel therapies, but they're starting to research that, and it looks like it might be quite important in novel therapies. The other things that we're looking at is combinations, because CLL is a smart cancer. Not as smart as the doctors and the patients who are dealing with it, but it's still a smart cancer and it can mutate around one drug. So what we're starting to look at, is the answer is gonna be cocktails. But there's really exciting cocktails. Some of them involve chemotherapy, chemoimmunotherapy, and novel agents. And some of them are only novel agents. Some of them are only oral pills that you take and the results are outstanding. We're getting very deep remissions. These are all very new. We don't know how durable these remissions will be, but it's very exciting. Well, Brian, it's just amazing to see you. I can't wait for us to be doing these conferences for many years to come. Right. And thank you, and stay well. You've got color. You're just looking great. I can't believe it's only been two months. Yeah, it's wonderful to see you. I still remember when we met in San Diego, mm -hmm. and you were desperate well, you, for care. Yeah. You were actually responsible for me meeting John Gribben because if you hadn't run that conference, I wouldn't have met him and I wouldn't have gone on the trial, so right. thank you. Right, so we're all, you know, we're all grateful. I mean, if it wasn't for my friend Andrew Seymour, mm. I wouldn't have met Dr. Bird and gotten into the Ibrutinib trial. Yeah. So, I mean, he introduced me to Dr. Bird. So it's all a network, yeah, yeah, and like yeah. one of the mottos I have is we're all in this together, and that's what we're here for, is to help each other. Great, thank you.